भगवान आत्म सजाग्रे 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 भगवान आत्म ट्रांसलेशन बाईज डिवाइन रेस ए सी भक्ति विरा स्वामी श्रपूपा की प्लीज रिपीट द ट्रांसलेशन in the beginning, in the beginning of, the of the material creation that absolute personality that absolute personality of godhead vasudeva vasudeva in his transcendental position in his transcendental position created the energies created of cause and effect by his own internal energy by his own internal energy is the purport the position of the lord is always transcendental because the causal and effectual energies required for the creation of the material world were also created by him he is unaffected therefore by the qualities of the material modes his existence form activities and paraphernalia all existed before the material creation he is all spiritual and has nothing to do with the qualities of the material world which are qualitatively distinct from the spiritual qualities of the lord the sanastrix and propa drives shri pad sankaracharya the head of the mayavada school accepts this transcendental position of lord krishna in his commentation on bhagavad gita jai 
Narayanam Namaskritya Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Jaiva Narotamam Naram Jaiva Narotamam Devim Saraswati Vyasam Devim Saraswati Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudiraya Tato Jaya Mudiraya Nasta Prayesha Badreshu Nasta Prayesha Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhagavati Bhavati Naishtiki Bhagavati Bhavati Naishtiki Om Ajnana Timirajasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshur Vimrita Mena Tasmai Shri Guruvay Jai Shmatu Paraki Jai So thank you so much Prabhu and Mataji and Chutra Keshava for having such a big heart to open up a commercial place into a center. It's really so nice. This is how actually we should use whatever assets we have in the service of Krishna. Nothing that is given. We must also remember that the reason why devotees are so large and big hearted is because Devotees recognize that everything that we have actually comes from Krishna. And that's why today's verse is very important. Today's verse tells us that in the beginning of material creation, that means right at the point before we were even created, at the beginning, when all the material ingredients were just created by Krishna, Krishna is the absolute personality of Godhead, Vasudeva. He created the energies of what we call cause and effect. Cause and effect is very important because everything that we do in this material world, there is always a cause, isn't it? There's something to start something, that's why it's a cause. And we don't realize as we live in this world that every cause has an effect. In other words, if you perform an action, there will always be a reaction. This is a very important point. So there is a cause and there's an effect to the cause. And a cause can mean any action. <coughs> For example, Prabhu and Mataji decided as a cause that they would open up what they have as a commercial property to become a bhakti center. That's a cause. The effect of it is that so many devotees are here today. That is an effect. And we, this cause is happening within material creation. But the important thing is because it is being done for Krishna, even though it appears like everything around us is material by nature, it has actually, the effect of the cause has actually been spiritualized. This is a very important point for us to remember. So even though material creation begins on the point of what appears to be material energy, the moment material energy is utilized for Krishna, even without us knowing it, there is an automatic transformation of that energy. It is no longer what we call Gunamaya. Gunamaya, Prabhupada writes very nicely in the purport, is actually the material modes of nature. Guna. You know, we have three modes of nature. We are all, at some point or another, predominated by some nature. Isn't it? it is, there is goodness, there is passion, and there is ignorance. Uh, a more easier way to understand that is when you use the word sattvic. Actually, goodness doesn't really capture what sattvic is saying. Sattvic is more than goodness, right? It is a state of mind which is very peaceful, you know, very um, very untouched by passion. And Rajasik is very passionate. And then you have Tamasik where, you know, it is very, it's very dull. And you will realize that all of us have some constitution of all three. Some of us by nature are very passionate. And it's very hard, you know, once we start something, it's very hard for us to be uh, detached from it. That's a great sign of passion. I want to do something. So even as devotees, we carry that baggage into our spiritual life. Prabhu, I want to start something. And then when we start it, uh, we are not detached from it. We become very attached to it. So if something happens to it, you know, we become upset. Oh, I've taken up this flower service. And then if the flower service doesn't go well or something is wrong, and then we become upset, you see. Uh, the service is, is inherently spiritual, but the material mode of nature is bearing on us. So what happens is, instead of becoming detached from it, as Bhagavatam tells us we should be, because of our rajasic nature, nature, we become attached to it. And that captures us, actually. 
And then you have what we call sattvic nature, goodness. And in goodness, it becomes easier for us to detach. When we become detached, the goodness helps us because we know we have performed something for Krishna. Now it's up to Krishna. What effect comes is actually from Krishna. So you see, in material world, you have cause and effect. But for a devotee, the devotee understands that that cause is actually coming from Krishna. We understand that we are instruments. So I may be doing some flower decoration, but at the end of the day, the flower decoration is being inspired by Krishna. It's not being, it's not just me. If you feel that you are the cause of something, then the chances are all the effect of it is on your head. And that can sometimes be a problem because it implicates us. But if, if we do something and we know that Krishna is in charge, then the result of it is not something we are very bothered by. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't come, it is still up to Krishna. We will try our best, but we are not in charge. Yesterday, for the program, I think I brought up this point of 11.33 of Bhagavad Gita. 11.33 of Bhagavad Gita is so important because there Krishna tells Arjuna emphatically, Mayai vaite vihata purva evam nimitta matra bhavya sadhya sachi. He actually calls, he actually addresses Arjuna as sadhya sachi. And you all know sadhya sachi actually means one who is very expert in shooting the arrows. Very skilled archer. So Krishna was telling Arjuna, you're very skilled, but I've got news for you. You're not killing anyone on the battlefield. <laughs> Everyone is being killed by me. By my arrangement, people are dying. I know who is going to die and who is not going to die. So then Arjuna may be thinking, if Krishna, you are the one deciding everything that's happening, if you are the cause of everyone who's going to uh, be either slain or who's going to be victorious, then what is my purpose? And that's a very important question because that's what we are thinking also. If Krishna is the cause of everything, then what is our purpose? Uh, then the last line of 11.33 is there. The last line of 11.33 says, uh, Nimitta Matra Bhavya Sabhya Sakhi. In other words, you become an instrument. Become an instrument. In other words, whatever that Krishna wants us to do, we do it. Of course, you will ask the question, how do we know what Krishna wants us to do? That's why we have the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita tells us exactly how we should behave. That's why we have Bhagavatam. Because Bhagavatam tells us what, what Krishna likes and what Krishna doesn't like. So, and if we don't if we don't know still what we want to do or what is Krishna's plan, then in 11.34 Bhagavad Gita, in the purport, Prabhupada writes an amazing point. Prabhupada says the plans of the Lord, right, are always absolute. In other words, whatever is Krishna's plan will prevail. Will prevail. Now, we all desire to come to Bhakti Center today. That was our desire. Of course, we planned. But finally, for us to reach here, He has to sanction. So there is one level of cause and effect, which is in the material energy. That's, we want to go somewhere, and the effect is we are planning to go. But there is another level of cause and effect, and that is coming from Vasudeva. That's why in this verse, Krishna is described as Vasudeva. Vasudeva means He's all-pervading. In other words, in every action that we do, he has to sanction it. That is very important. He is known in 1323 of Bhagavad Gita as Upadrishta Anumantaha. He is the permitter and he is the overseer. You know, in, in material world, we always say, Prabhu, where is the oversight over something? Someone has to have oversight, right? Like right now, you know, Prabhu, Mataji, they are having oversight of Bhakti Center. So that's why we are all very peaceful. We come because they are taking care of everything. And if they don't allow that door to be open, we can't come in actually. So they are also the permitters, right? So Upadrishta and Anumanta is happening at that level. At least at this moment, we are their mercy. But for them to be able to open the door, they have to arrive at Bhakti Center. And for that to happen, Krishna has to sanction. You see? So there is one level of cause and effect, but there is another level of cause and effect. And that level of cause and effect is not Gunamaya. That level of cause and effect is transcendental energy of Krishna. So we should be very clear that material creation is created by Krishna, but he is not touched by it. No one can stop Krishna from entering the center. No one can stop Krishna from deciding what will happen in the center. Because he is transcendental to the modes of material nature. But the modes of material nature, they catch us. Very often we are disturbed by the modes. 
sometimes you know you want to wake up from Mangalati and you think last night you know we had a big Janmashtami program we are all very tired the mind is telling you you know I've worked so hard for Krishna just one day don't tell me Krishna will strike me down if I don't wake up from Mangalati and we sleep and then the next day when we had to wake up is Monday already or I have to go to work now if I don't if I can't concentrate and I don't have enough sleep then I will not be doing my work and isn't that also a duty to Krishna so let's skip Mangalati for the seven days. And like that, you know, you can skip seven days. And it's all the mode of ignorance. Tamasi. It is. So that mode is also very prevalent. And especially for devotees, when we take up devotional service, the, the tamasic mode actually challenges us the most, right? Because generally speaking, for devotees, we have to sleep a little less. Uh, we have to wake up, you know, much quicker than others. We have to do a lot of cooking. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of service mm -hmm. to be done. There are many do's and don'ts, can't do this, can't do that, you know. And so the mode of, of ignorance very often can push us into saying, why so many rules and regulations? Do we really need them, you know? I remember some new people come to programs and they see, you know, that you all don't do this, don't do that, then what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what can you do, you know? But they don't realize that when you actually perform these, what we call rules or regulations, they free us. Why? They free the mind. They free the mind from gunamaya. They free the mind from the mode of ignorance. And therefore, the mind moves from the mode of ignorance to the mode of passion, where we want to do something for Krishna. But because our sadhana is good, that passion is transformed into the mode of goodness. And because our sadhana elevates us, that mode of goodness moves us to the Vishuddha platform. That is very, very important. So that is why in this shloka, it is so nicely stated that in the beginning of material creation, Krishna as, as Vasudev, he was, he's always transcendental, but he creates the energy of cause and effect. This is a very important point. Now in, in, in Bhagavatam, in Bhagavatam, I think it's in the third canto, and I think it's 26th chapter, Fourth verse, three twenty six four. Prabhupada gives a purport that explains this shloka very easily and very nicely. That's the beauty of Bhagavatam. You know, there's there's always a there's always a shloka that explains another shloka. There's always a purport from Shla Prabhupada that explains another part of Bhagavatam. The only thing we have to do is study actually. So in that purport, Prabhupada says very nicely that the word gunamaya or gunamayin actually means invested with the modes of nature. In other words, Krishna invests in this mode of nature. He creates the material world, but he invests his energy into it. Why is this practically important to us? We have to respect material energy. It's very important. If we think that we are above material energy just because we, we become devotees, that's the day we are trapped by material energy. It's very dangerous. Yesterday we spoke about Janmashtami. You know, Devaki Mata was very fearful of Kamsa. Not because Kamsa was going to kill him, or not because, you know, as a devotee she was weak. No. Prabhupada writes in the purports of, of Srimad Bhagavatam in that part of Krishna book, not Krishna book, in the actual Bhagavatam. Prabhupada writes that Devaki Mata represents devotional service. She represents devotional service. Kamsa represents material association. A devotee is always fearful of material association because the devotee respects the power of the material energy. Very nice point. You know, when you have a very formidable opponent, you respect the opponent. It doesn't mean, you know, you just dismiss the opponent. You have to respect your opponent. And therefore, Devaki Mata was very respectful of material energy of Krishna because she knew it was very powerful. This material energy of Krishna is so powerful, even Lord Shiva could get bewildered when he saw Mohini Murti. Even Brahmaji, when he created the feminine form, he could become distracted. Even the demons who were very powerful and wanted to get Amrit from the churning of the milk ocean, when Krishna came in the form of Mohini Murti, they were completely, uh, they were completely bewildered. They were completely smitten. They were completely mesmerized. So the material energy of Krishna is very, very powerful. But Devaki Mata took the humble position and those who are humble, they are automatically in the mode of goodness. And humility protects the devotee. And therefore the cause and effect that happens in the material world doesn't touch a devotee who is humble. 
because they expect, you know, that yes, material nature is powerful because Krishna has created it. And that's why Prabhupada writes in the purport, this energy that has come from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it has come in two ways, Prabhupada writes. In the first way, it has come as the emanation of the Super Soul. In other words, Krishna creates this entire universe, so it's coming from Krishna. And secondly, this material energy is like a covering of the Lord's face, Srila Prabhupada writes. It's like the covering of the Lord's face. In other words, Krishna's face is there, but it's partially covered. So we have a glimpse of Krishna, but we are not sure actually how Krishna really looks. Prabhupada goes on in the purport to say something very nice. He says, easier way to understand this material energy of Krishna is to understand it by way of the sun and the cloud. The cloud has a way of blocking the sun. But factually speaking, the sun is always present. Isn't it true? The sun is always there. It's just that at certain angles, depending on where you are, it appears like the cloud is covering the sun. But actually it is not. The sun is there, the cloud happens to pass by, and it appears to be covering. So actually Krishna is very powerful, and he is not covered by anything. The covering comes from our lenses. The covering comes from our being invested in the modes of material nature, instead of being invested in devotional service. This is very important point. Another nice way Bhagavatam describes this is in 3711 of Srimad Bhagavatam. There, uh, there, Maitriya tells a very nice point to Vidura. He says that just like if you were to look at the reflection of a moon in water, right? The nature of water is to quiver. The nature of water is to ripple. In a lake, you know, when wind comes, there's a bit of ripple. Now, if someone sees the reflection of the moon in the lake, we would think that the moon is also rippling, isn't it? How, how quick Bhagavatam is to catch this? Eh? Bhagavatam says you would, be mis you, you would think that the nature of the moon is to quiver. Kampa this, it's to ripple or to quiver. But actually, the nature of the moon is not to quiver. Because if you really look up and see the moon, you realize, wait a minute, the moon is not quivering, it's very still. It's the nature of the water that's quivering. So sometimes our problem is, Depending on our devotional service, we do not see the cause of things in this world. We see the rippling effect and we think that is the cause. And that is why the effect also bewilders us in this material world. This is a very important point that Krishna gives us actually. And there are, if, there are very wonderful examples of devotees in Bhagavatam who crossed over this bewilderment of why is something happening to me? In other words, why is this being caused to me? And why must the effect of this cause happen to me? Very often devotees are put in difficulties. And we ask that question, why is this happening to me, Prabhu? You know, some, sometimes devotees will say, Prabhu, when I was a materialist, you know, actually I had a better life. <laughs> the moment I came to devotional service, my God, Krishna just threw everything at me. <laughs> some devotees tell me, after initiation, my God, things became very bad. I thought I was supposed to take shelter. You are. It's meant to for you to take more shelter because there's more problems, isn't it? Better actually. But it's difficult for us to see it that way, you see. But in Bhagavatam, the great devotees of the Lord, they see the cause as Krishna. We see the cause as, oh, you did this to me. You did that to me. And therefore the effect is, oh, because of you, I will react this way. And in that way, we are implicated in the material energy. We are not freed from the material energy. One good example in Bhagavatam I can think of is in the 17th chapter of the first canto. Because over there, you remember the cow and the bull. The bull is Dharma and cow is Bhumi Devi. And one day, you know, as the personality of Kali was advancing in the kingdom of Parikshit Maharaj, Bhagavatam tells us that the bull met the cow and they were both in pitiful condition. The bull had been mercilessly beaten by the personality of Kali to the point where the bull was only standing on one leg, right? That's why in Kali Yuga, there's only one leg left. And what is that leg? It's supposed to be honesty and truth. But you would not be remiss if you think, really, is there truth in Kali Yuga? Because even that is going. Only one leg is left. No mercy, no austerity, nothing. Only one leg. And the cow also was beaten to the point, you know, where she was also crying. And so they met each other. And Parikshit Maharaj was on his chariot and he had heard that the personality of Kali had already stepped into his kingdom and was moving around 
and destroying and disturbing people. So what did Kari, what did Parikshit Maharaj do? He moved around looking for the personality of Kali, and he saw what had happened. So he immediately got down, took his sword, and he was going. He dragged the personality of Kali, but in order to dispense justice, what he had to do was he had to go to the cow and the bull, and he had to ask the cow and the bull, "Can you identify the perpetrator of this?" Achyuta Keshava Prabhu would know that even in criminal law, before we finally finish off a case, we want you know our witnesses to identify the perpetrator. You know, you hear it in movies. You know, where where people say, "Is the accused in court today?" And the person says, "Yes, that's the person." <laughs> now that's what the personality of Kali wanted. He wanted the cow and the bull to confirm and double confirm that the personality of Kali had actually done that to them. So he turns to Kali. I mean, he turns to the cow and the bull, and he tells them that you please tell now whether they, he is the one who did it. And to his amazement, the cow and the bull, they look at each other and they begin a conversation. They are beaten, they are in difficulty. But Prabhupada writes in the purport of 117.18, I think. I think it's 117.18 purport. Prabhupada writes there that although the bull, the personality of religion, knew perfectly well that the personality of Kali was the direct cause of their pain and their suffering, Prabhupada writes still, as devotees of the Lord, they knew well also that without the sanction of the Lord, no one could inflict trouble upon them. Isn't that amazing? Just think about it. The cow and the bull were beaten. The cause, Kali is there. But when asked, is it who is the person who did this? They thought very carefully. And they thought to themselves, actually, who has sanctioned this, even for Kali to do this? Kali is strong, but he's not so strong. Krishna is complete. Krishna is absolute. Only Krishna can sanction something. And so in that way they were thinking that if that is the case, can we really blame Kali for what is happening? You see, the realization of a devotee, can we really blame Kali? And so they refused to point the finger at Kali. And Maharaj Parikshit was a bit frustrated, but he thought, never mind, I'll just drag Kali out anyway. But the point is, the cow and the bull, by not identifying the perpetrator, they transcended this material nature. That is the point to be understood. They transcended material nature. The moment we say, oh, you know, um, the program did not go well because of you, Prabhu, then we have forgotten to transcend. And in devotional community, it's very dangerous for us to do that. Oh, it's because of this Mataji, that Prabhu, that I'm in difficulty. Or because of this, because of that, I'm in difficulty. I can't do my service because the conditions were not favorable. You know, I could not perform my sadhana because of this, because of that. But who is the cause of all this? Finally, the cow and the bull are showing us the royal path. The royal path is that ultimately, Krishna is the cause of everything. He is the ultimate sanctioner. Prabhupada writes in a famous purport in the second canto, a thief who enters the house, Krishna as super soul is inspiring him to steal. <laughs> and then, Krishna also inspires the owner of the house to wake up and catch the thief. <laughs> you scratch your head, isn't it? How does this work? How does it work? But Krishna is super soul. Therefore, nothing in this world can happen. Not a blade of grass can move without Krishna's sanction. Sometimes people say, that means Krishna is the cause of, Kali's, uh, of the cow and the bull's difficulty, isn't it? Not true. Uh, the easiest way to understand it is this. Now, I'm coming from Singapore and I'm coming to Australia. I fly into Sydney. Now, I want to enter Sydney. The Sydney, the Australian immigration has no clue about my motives of entering Australia. I may want to come here to harm people. Or I may want to come here to serve people. But I don't, they don't know. And frankly speaking, it is not their lookout. But for me to enter Sydney, to enter Australia, I need the sanctioning of the immigration authority. That sanction is needed. Now once I enter and if I do something wrong, and they catch me, I can't tell them, you just sanction me to enter. Because they will very politely tell you, I sanctioned you to enter, but I didn't sanction your actions. Your actions are yours. 
But I sanction you to perform an action. In other words, to enter is Krishna's domain. But what you do after you enter, that's up to you. You see the point? So, Krishna allowed us to enter Bhakti Center. But what we do now during Bhagavatam, that's our minute independence. You can either sleep, you can look at empty, you can look out, or you can say, when is Prabhu going to finish? <laughs> it's up to you. Can we move forward? Prabhu is telling us to move forward. This is a happy problem, no? Yes, we have Let's so go. many devotees, there's no space. Very nice. Come, on. come forward. In Singapore, sometimes we have so many devotees in India, I invite them to come and sit here. So, <laughs> yeah, devotees here, devotees here, devotees there, because it's, it's so full, you know, it's, it's very nice. So this is the thing that we must understand. The cow and the bull understood this fine point. Yes, someone has hurt us, but ultimately Krishna has sanctioned it. When you understand Krishna has sanctioned it, what happens? Two things happen to us, that's the effect part of it. The effect of knowing Krishna is the sanctioner is that the cow and the bull became peaceful. Because they discussed spiritual topics and they remember Krishna. Instead of becoming so angry with Kali, they tried to understand that, well, Kali was an instrument in Krishna's hand, but maybe there is something that we have done and now we have to pay for it. That is how the cow and the bull felt. That's the same thing Parikshit Maharaj felt. And he's the second example of cause and effect. Parikshit Maharaj was cursed by Shringi Brahmana. Why? Because he put a garland of a dead snake on his father, Shamika Rishi. And why did he do that? Because he was very thirsty and very hungry and very tired. And he entered the ashram of Shamika Rishi and he was sitting down and meditating on Krishna, so absorbed that he forgot to even see that there was a king. And by Krishna's arrangement, Parikshit Maharaj did something which was very unusual. He became upset. He's a great devotee. But even devotees should be given a chance to be upset, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Surely devotees also should be given a chance to be upset. We can't be perfect. That's the beauty of Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is not in the sky showing us perfection. And then we are thinking we are so imperfect. <clears throat> What's the point of Bhagavatam? Bhagavatam shows us situations that we are most likely to be put in. So Parikshit Maharaj was put in a very awkward situation. He was very hungry, very thirsty, didn't know what to do, asked for water, didn't get anything, wasn't even given a place to sit down. So he thought, fine, if this is how you are, he picked up a dead snake and he put it, I'll put a garland on him and he walked away. Bit of mischief, you know, sometimes we do that, isn't it? I mean, I don't think we put garlands of dead snakes. <laughs> sometimes we do that to each other, you know, I'm angry, I walk off in a half or I say something which I shouldn't have said, you know, which is out of character. And he went away. Shamika Rishi had no clue about it, right? He was just remembering Krishna. And then he realized that this is what happened. But Shringi Brahmana, his son, was very upset. Now, Brahmana and being upset should not go hand in hand. Brahmana should not be upset, you know? But because of Kali's influence and Krishna's arrangement, Shringi became very upset. And so he cursed Parikshit Maharaj. And he cursed him that in seven days he would die. And he would die of a snake bite. Because you put a garland of dead snake, right? Snake will bite you. And that's what he did. Now, when Parikshit Maharaj had put the garland of dead snake on uh, Shamika Rishi, as he left, he immediately started repenting. He started repenting in his heart. This is the mood of a devotee. A devotee realizes very quickly that their actions are either all right or not all right. Because Super Soul is very much in touch with us. We know when we've done something not right. Whether we admit it is a different story, but actually in our heart, we know it. We know it. But sometimes our pride is there. I don't want to say sorry. But we know it. So he knew it. And immediately as he knew it, he started praying very hard. He prayed in Bhagavatam that if anything should happen, any calamity should happen now, I take responsibility for it. I take full responsibility for it. And it should happen right now. Because I don't want the karmas to go to my uh, dependence and my, uh, and my kingdom. This is very nice very considerate. He accepted it. He accepted it. So this cause and effect is also working here. He, he created a situation where he did something, the effect was coming, but he was prepared for it. A devotee sees the hand of Krishna, so he's prepared to see what Krishna wants to give. And true enough, he heard before he reached the kingdom that Sringi Brahmana had cursed him. 
in those days when they had no internet, you know, no WhatsApp, but they got their messages very quickly. Somehow they knew it, you know. So it came, <clears throat> it came to him, and he knew immediately that he was cursed. Now, how did Parikshit Maharaj react? The cause had happened. What was the effect on Parikshit Maharaj? The effect was very nice. Instead of counter cursing, he could easily have counter cursed. Parikshit Maharaj could have counter cursed. Do you remember when Daksha cursed, uh, when, when Daksha actually criticized Lord Shiva in the fourth canto? Uh, Lord Shiva's, you know, uh, Lord Shiva's followers, Nandi and all of them, they cursed the Brahmanas and they cursed Daksha. And then the Brahmanas and Daksha counter cursed Nandi. And then Nandi counter cursed, and they counter cursed, and they counter cursed. And in all that, Lord Shiva got up and walked away. <laughs> He just got so morose and tired, you know, that he just walked away from them. He did not want to be in the cause and effect of material nature. He was up, up above it. So Parikshit Maharaj could easily have cursed Sri Brahmana. He was such a powerful devotee, he could have done it. But he didn't do it. Instead, he sings a very beautiful prayer. Tasyeva meghasya parabaresho Vyasakta chittasya graheshu abhikshnam Nirveda mulo dvijasa parupo yatra prasakto vijama shudatte. It's a very beautiful verse. I think it's from the first canto, 19th chapter, 14th or 15th verse, somewhere there. And there, Parikshit Maharaj says to Krishna, he says, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he is the controller of both the transcendental and mundane worlds. This is what our shloka is telling us today. Krishna is transcendental, but he controls this world also. He controls it through the material nature. That's how he controls it. So Parikshit Maharaj first accepted, Krishna, you are the supreme controller. When he starts a prayer by saying Krishna is supreme controller, what he's saying is, what has happened to me is under your control. It may appear to be that someone is doing something, but Krishna, you are the sanctioning authority. You have control. You try it the next time. If something happens to you, the moment you remember the shloka and say, Krishna is in control, you'll not feel so bad that someone slapped you. you take it. But if you don't chant the shloka, right, you slap the person back. That's what you do. That is why we have shlokas in Bhagavatam. They are not meant just to be, you know, chanted. They are meant to be acted upon. They are meant to be acted upon. So the moment he said, Krishna, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you are the controller of the transcendental and mundane world, then he says, you have graciously overtaken me in the form of a Brahmana's curse. In other words, Parikshit Maharaj did not see Shamika Rishi's curse, uh, no, Shringi Brahmana's curse as Shringi Brahmana's curse. He said, no, it's Krishna who has come in the form of a curse. It looks like some Brahmana curse, but it is Krishna. It is Krishna. He had the eyes to see. What an amazing verse. And how did Krishna come? Krishna came like a car, you know. Sometimes a car just comes and it overtakes you, isn't it? You're driving, driving on the road. You see a car a little bit further away, but it's a fast car. Before you know it, it overtakes you. That's how Krishna has come. Sometimes in our life it's like that. We're just cruising along. Suddenly something happens and we, we don't know why. But the devotee understands Krishna just overtook me. Krishna just decided, you know, to change course for me. And so he says, Krishna came in the form of a Brahmana's curse. And now he says, why Krishna has come like that? He says, due to my being too much attached to family life and the kingdom, he has come now to take me out in such a way that I will have to become fully dependent on him and I will detach myself from the world. This is how a devotee accepts cause and effect. Something that looks very abstract, Bhagavatam has made it very practical. Isn't it very practical? You see, Gajendra was caught by the jaws of the crocodile. You remember? And the crocodile caught Gajendra not for one day, two days, no, 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Gajendra's wives were all waiting for him. His children were waiting for him. His generals were trying to pull him. But no one could do anything. Finally, the wife said, My dear husband, you were very nice. But we need a husband who's there to help us, not a husband who's stuck by a crocodile. <laughs> so I'm very sorry, but we have to leave you and we have to find some other husband. 
And then the children said, what to do? We like you very much, Father, but we like our mother better. It happens, you know. And so they move with the mother also. Right? They move with the mother. Yeah, it always happens. You know, I try very hard to be there for the children. And, you know, any problems, you come and talk to me. And then uh, mother's a bit straight. But if they have a problem, the first stop is mother. And then I get second-hand news. And I think, what did I do? I'm there. But then I, I asked my Guru Maharaj one time, and he said, well, mother suffered more than you did for labor. <laughs> so whatever happens, the children will go back to them. You just stood there and prayed for her, but you didn't go through the labor. And so in the same way, you know, Krishna is so kind that, was, that the Jindra was standing there. And he was hoping that his wives would be there, but they left. He was hoping his children would be there, but they left. He could have blamed the crocodile for everything. But he was very intelligent. At that point of time, he began thinking seriously. I am now pranasya, vivasho, dehi. I am circumstantially helpless. I am circumstantially helpless. Have you been in situations where you thought you had it all figured out? And then suddenly circumstances just change and before you know it, something has just dropped on you. It's happened to all of us. I'm seeing everyone shaking their heads. <laughs> happens all the time. All the time. One person came and saw my Guru Maharaj. Maharaj, I wanted to marry her. And suddenly I got married to someone else. <laughs> and Maharaj told him, you read Gajendra prayers. <laughs> now you have to save yourself from that situation. <laughs> so for a thousand years, Gajendra was caught. He couldn't do anything. And so he finally decided that let me turn to the cause of all causes. Paramparayanam, the shelter of all shelters. And in doing so, he chanted his beautiful prayers of Gajendra Moksha. And after he chanted all those prayers, then in so much difficulty, when Lord Vishnu heard that prayer, he came on Garuda. And, and Gajendra was really, 1,000 years, he had no strength left. But when he saw Krishna coming, right, with whatever strength he had, he plucked a lotus flower and he held it up to the Lord. What a sweet gesture huh, from an elephant. And he held up the lotus flower to Krishna. Why? Because he accepted that the cause of my difficulty is not the crocodile. It is Krishna. It is Krishna. And this is the mood of a devotee. That is why Parikshit Maharaj, even though at the end of seven days, it appeared like the snake bird had actually bitten him. The truth of the matter, Bhagavatam said, the snake bird only had bitten his sharir. Parikshit Maharaj, had already connected with Krishna. There was, he was finally lifted from the curse. There was no pain in the end for him. We must have that faith that in whatever situation we are put, as long as we know Krishna is the cause of all causes, then we should definitely have the faith that Krishna will care for us. Krishna will never, never put us in a difficulty that he cannot give us the strength to come out from. And that is why Krishna is known as Otam Protam. Mm -hmm. I think it is in 6, 6, 3, it's in the 6th canto, 3rd chapter, Yamaraj prayers. And he's known as Otam Protam. Otam, I think, is crosswise and Protam is lengthwise, right? Crosswise and lengthwise. In other words, you know all your fabric, this, uh, this chaga, dhoti, they're all actually, if you look very carefully, they're all made of threads which are crisscrossing, right? And because the threads are crisscrossing, and depending on the quality of the thread, the crisscrossing is what holds the chagat together. The crisscrossing is what holds the dhoti together. If there is no crisscrossing, right, your dhoti will collapse. Not a very good thing to happen, but it will collapse. <laughs> okay, it will collapse. So this is the danger. But because Krishna is otam and he is protam, everything he is holding, you see the way Yamaraj chants it, beautiful, isn't it? you'll never forget it, you know. Krishna is at the junction of every part of our life. Every junction of our life, Krishna is there. So a devotee, if we understand this verse, the takeaway from this verse, is that if we see, if we cultivate our eyes, if we cultivate our consciousness, to see a remote cause as Krishna, an immediate cause as something, which is an instrument in the hand of Krishna, then we'll become peaceful. Krishna will give us the ability to actually accept things which are difficult in life. 
Otherwise, Prabhu and Mataji, when, when awkward situations happen to us, right, it's very easy for our faith to be shaken. Very easy for us to say, how can Krishna do this to me? But the question we should ask is, why can't Krishna do this to me? You know, we often ask this question, why me? Why not you? Why not you? What is so big about you that you cannot suffer? So you see the arrogance that we have. I've taken up Krishna consciousness, you jolly well protect me, Krishna. <laughs> it's a demand, you see. But the pure devotees don't think that way. They think, Krishna, I've taken up Krishna consciousness. If you want to embrace me, or if you want to treat me roughly, then you do as you want. We cannot think in our head that that is a very far away concept. It will never happen to us. Srila Prabhupada wanted all his, all his disciples and all devotees to become pure devotees. It is our duty to become pure devotees. It is not a false, it is false humility to say, oh Prabhu, I'm very impure. It doesn't help. It doesn't help the cause, it doesn't help the movement. Every one of us has a duty to become a pure devotee. Because then we will be perfect instruments in the hands of Krishna. The good news about becoming instruments is that, in law, Achyuta Geshwar Prabhu, instruments have no liability. Now he will tell you that. So, the knife in the hand of a surgeon can heal. The knife in the hand of a thief can hurt. But nobody will blame the knife. You follow? Yeah. So if you become an instrument of Krishna and anything goes wrong, you just point to Krishna. <laughs> I tried my best, but I'm an instrument in Krishna's hand. You see? Krishna is so kind that he takes all responsibility. Because he knows devotees are responsible themselves. So we end today by remembering a very practical point. What happens when we are placed in difficult situation? Brahmaji answered this question very nicely. He answered this very nicely to Prithu Maharaj. In the fourth canto, 19th chapter, 34th verse. Prithu Maharaj was put in a very awkward situation because he was going to finish his Ashwamedha sacrifices, 100. But Indra kept interrupting it. And he became very fed up of the situation. And he thought, why should this happen? Mind you. Prithu Maharaj is a plenary portion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he's showing us if he becomes awkward and frustrated, what will happen to us? So he became very awkward and he wanted to vanquish Indra. But Brahma came and said, no, you can't do that. Actually, the Brahmanas wanted to do it. And Brahma told the Brahmanas, you're Brahmanas for God's sakes. Why are you thinking of killing people? You shouldn't be doing that. And then Brahma told all of them, Masmin Maharaj Krita Swachinta Nisha Mayasma Dvacha Adritatma Yadhyayato Dhaiva Hatam Nukartu Mano Tirushtam Vishate Tamo Andham. The translation is very nice. Brahma told Prithu and the Brahmanas, My dear king, specifically to Prithu, do not be agitated or anxious. Two A's. Do not be agitated or anxious because your sacrifices have not been properly executed due to providential impediments. So he said, you think it's Indra, but it is the higher will. Krishna doesn't want you to finish a hundred sacrifices, so drop it. You're trying and trying. Have you been in situations where you are going this way? But all the circumstances are such, you have to be pushed that way. Then you know it is Krishna. It's providential arrangement. So Brahma told them, kindly take my words with great respect. Brahmaji is so respectful. Kindly take my words with great respect. We should always remember that if something happens by providential arrangement, we should not be very sorry. Very nice point. Sometimes we feel very sorry for ourselves, you know. Oh, poor me. I feel so bad, you know. People treat me so badly. I'm so nice to devotees. They don't speak to me nicely. We start feeling very sorry for ourselves. It's a symptom of our false ego, actually. It's a very dangerous way to feel false ego. So we should not feel sorry for ourselves. Vidura was chastised by Duryodhan. Duryodhan called him the son of a cap mistress. Can you imagine that? And told, him, told them to throw him out with nothing but breath with him, nothing but a breath with him, nothing else with him. Duryodhana put, no, Vidura put down his bow and his arrow and he walked out even before he was thrown out. 
But Bhagavatam says, even though he was afflicted by the harsh words of, of uh, Duryodhan, he was not sorry. Why was he not sorry? Because he saw the hand of Krishna. Because he considered the external energy of the Supreme to be supreme. That's the exact verse that was that stated in the third canto. He saw Krishna's hand. And in fact, because he saw Krishna's hand, Vidura had such a good time after he left the palace, isn't it? He went for Yatra, he traveled, you know, he sat down, he's met Uddhava, he met Maitriya, he heard whole Bhagavatam. So you see, it wasn't a bad deal. He was thrown out, but it wasn't a bad deal. Parikshit Maharaj, yes, he was cursed, but was it a bad deal? Seven days with a personality like Shukadev Goswami, I think we will all wait in line to be cursed. <laughs> Not a bad deal at all. Seven days. At least he knew by the end of seven days he's going to die. Do we know when are we going to die? Yamaraj is not going to give us seven days notice. He won't. Yamasya karuna nasti. Yamaraj has no compassion. You may be bathing and suddenly he will take you. You may not be ready. I'm, you know, I haven't put tilak. Never mind. I'm taking you. He will just take you. He will take you. So you see, devotees. That's what Brahmaji is saying. If something happens by providential arrangement, don't be sorry. And now he gives the most important lesson for us. The more you try to rectify such reversals, the more we enter into the darkest regions of materialistic thought. That's a warning from Brahma. The more you try to fight the hand of Krishna, the more you will feel the slaps of Maya. That's my translation. Yeah. That's Maya slaps. You know, we are all going to get those slaps. And Prabhupada's purport is so nice. I'm just going to read it because it's just five lines, but it's amazing. Sometimes the saintly or very religious persons also have to meet with reversals in life. Prabhupada is telling us that. Such incidences should be taken as providential. Cause and effect. Take it as Krishna's hand. Although there may be sufficient cause for being unhappy, one should avoid counteracting such reversals. For the more we, we do that, we become implicated in rectifying such reversals. The more we enter into the darkest regions of material anxiety. And Prabhupada ends the line beautifully. Lord Krishna has also advised us in this connection. We should tolerate things instead of being agitated. Let's, let's repeat that one beautiful line of Shri Prabhupada. We should tolerate things, we should tolerate instead, things. Of instead, of instead of becoming agitated. We should tolerate things, we should tolerate instead, things. Of instead of becoming agitated. We should tolerate things, we should tolerate things. instead of being agitated. Jai Vrindra Srimad Bhagavatam Ki. So if after this, uh, you know, Achyuta Geshwa Prabhu stands up and says, you know, there's no prasad for today. <laughs> We should tolerate it. <laughs> Instead of being. Jai Gandharashram and Bhagavatam ki. Jai. Shri La Prabhupada ki. Jai. Shri La Gurudev ki. Jai. Ananta Gauri Vaishnava in the ki. Jai. I go over a great man. So be happy in your devotional service. We like, we like nothing, Prabhu said Mataji. There's nothing we like. All the things that we think we like is in our mind. Nothing we like. We are so fortunate. So fortunate. So please be happy with your devotion service. If you come to devotion service and you cannot smile, something is wrong. <laughs> then you might as well go back to what you were doing. It doesn't make sense. The ultimate test of devotion service is you should be, we should be able to smile at each other. Huh? Not, you know, long face, you know, not happy. Oh, this Prabhu is like that, and that Mataji is like that, and this situation is like that. Then go back to material world because that's what we were doing, right? When we come here, see things with a different lens. See things with a different lens. You can either see a, a small black dot on a white wall, right? Or you can just say, hey, it's a beautiful white wall. It's just, it's just a small black dot. It's up to you. It's really up to you. It's up to you. This is the meaning of cause and effect. I'll stop here now. Hare Krishna. His grace, dear Kiran and Das Prabhuji Ki. Are there any questions, any comments, realizations, or hands on doing? We'll start with you. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu, when we think that everything, the causes, we put the, all the causes in Krishna. I know people, what's coming. <laughs> people will be very responsible. Whatever they can behave erratically, you know. 
So what do you think is the answer? You know the answer. <laughs> you also know the answer. What would you tell your son, for example, if he asked you this question? You would tell him to behave responsibly. Right? You would say that, yes, there is a cause for everything, but we cannot put everything on Krishna because Krishna is also in our heart. We have to behave responsibly. You cannot go to a devotee and stop him and say, Prabhu, we all this You can't do that. And we know that also. It's just the mischief in us that always will ask, well, if that's the case, then why can't we do something? But we know the answer. So actually, you know the answer, Prabhu. And I think we know the answer. Yes, Prabhuji, you had a question. Yes, yes. Hare Krishna. My question is, you talked about when uh, things happened uh, which are adversarial, you accept it as the will of God. Um, but then we also need to do our karma, our duty. Um, at what point do we know, okay, this is only so much that I can do, um, and we sort of then accept it? Very good point. Yeah, when, when do we draw the line, right? First of all, everyone's line is different. Because everyone's life and everyone's circumstances is different. So to draw a line and say that is the line is not the correct thing. But Bhagavatam tells us that if our sadhana and our devotional service is good, and if we take the association of senior devotees and guidance, they will be able to guide us very nicely when we have this question. That is why we have our spiritual masters. That is why we have Bhagavatam. And that is why chanting and sadhana, they give us the knowledge by which we can come to understand these things. So. Everybody will have a different line to draw. But, but Bhagavatam gives us some clues. Like Prithu Maharaj. So many times he tried to stop Indra, but Indra kept coming back. That's why Brahma said, look, so many times he's trying to do this, so many times you're counteracting. You are not remembering Krishna, he's not remembering Krishna. So when we are in situations, Prabhu, where we are trying so hard to achieve an outcome and we don't get it, then we should understand that that outcome is not meant to be then we should just increase the quality of our devotional service, do what we have to do to the best of our ability, and leave the result to Krishna. Does that help, Prabhuji? Hmm? Everyone will have that turning point in our lives. You know? Some things come very easily without effort. You know, in Bhagavatam, it is known as Yadrichaya. Yadrichaya means without separate endeavor, or in the ordinary course of activities. Very often, in the ordinary course of activities, many things are obtained. That is meant for us. But sometimes, extraneously, materially, we try very hard, but it doesn't come. So that is there. Some people try so hard to make money, but it doesn't happen to them. Some people try without, some people can't stop making money. <laughs> Isn't it? I, I, I know a client who tells me, you know, I, you know you, I've got so much money, I don't know how to spend it in this lifetime. Can you imagine that? <laughs> there are people like that. And there are people who work so hard, they will never see any money. They will try and try and they can't. They can't. You know, there's a very nice shloka in Bhagavatam, 7240. My, my Guru much liked that shloka, 7240. Sometimes one loses money on a public street, where everyone can see it. And yet his money is protected by destiny and not seen by others. Have you had been in a situation where you dropped something in public and you thought you lost it? You went back and hey, it's there. No one picked it up. Then Bhagavatam says, but a man who, lo who loses that, he can get it back. On the other hand, the Lord does not give protection. If the Lord does not give protection, you may be keeping something very, very safely in your house. And you can lose it. My father does this all the time. When he wants to keep something, right, and it's very, very precious, he keeps it in such a secret place, he forgets it. <laughs> So many hours I spent trying to find it because it's so confidential and so secret, I don't know where it is now. And years have passed, he still doesn't know where he kept it. It's at home, but you can't find it. It's happened to us. You may lose something, but it's not meant to go, it will come back to you. But you may keep something with you, but if it's meant to go, it will leave you. This is also stated in Bhagavatam. Can you imagine? Bhagavatam covers every situation possible. 7 to 40, go and read it. It's amazing. But that's the point, I think, that Asim Prabhu is saying. You know, that where do we know how to draw the line? We have to see the hand of Krishna. Mm -hmm. One last question, maybe. Yes, Prabhu. Okay, I have two questions, but I think it's a very nice 
one is about the rules and regulations free our mind from ignorance. How we understand this? Again, Prabhu, the rules and regulations? Rules and regulation frees our mind. Ah, how rules and regulations yeah. frees our mind. From, from ignorance, yes. Yeah. So how yeah. we understand Actually, this is premised on the principle of regulative principles of freedom in Bhagavad Gita. I think it's 64 or 66. 264 or 266. 64, right? 264. What it means, Prabhu, is this. When we regulate our senses, in other words, when we regulate them for sense enjoyment, in other words, they become disciplined, what happens is that by becoming disciplined, the senses actually free the mind and the mind becomes regulated. The nature of the mind is if you let it be, it actually overcomes you. A mind which is uncontrolled will eventually control you because you will move to the dictations of the mind. But a mind that becomes regulated by habits, conditioned by habits, which are considered to be spiritual, then the mind comes under the control of the intelligence. They are two different things, Guru. Really. And when the intelligence has control over the mind, Bhagavatam says, then the mind becomes a friend. But when mind overcomes intelligence because it is unregulated, it goes wherever it wants, it does whatever it wants, every single thought that the mind comes, you have to run after it because mind tells you you have to run after it. You have no control over the mind. Then what happens is an uncontrolled mind becomes a foe. It becomes an enemy. So when you have regulated principles, like in our devotional service, you wake up at a certain time, you regulate your tongue by eating food offered to Krishna. You don't eat things which are not good for your mind and your consciousness. It may appear to be an imposition. And actually the person telling you it's an imposition is your mind. Because mind doesn't want to be imposed on. But that imposition actually disciplines the mind. It's like a child. If you let a child just run and do whatever they want, don't give them a sense of purpose, a sense of order, a sense of schedule, the child will grow up in a very unruly fashion. But when some imposition of discipline is given to the child, it looks painful, it looks like the child is being caged, but ultimately the child turns out to be actually very regulated and more free to be able to use the mind in the way that he or she should use it. That is the meaning of regulated principles of freedom. What looks like, a, uh, like imprisonment actually leads to freedom, ironically. But in the material world, that is an alien concept. They think it is an imposition of the mind. Is that helpful, bro? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Very good question. That's all the time we have. It's nine times. Sorry, I took more time. Thank you, Prabhu Smatajis, very much for your time. Tomorrow I fly. And Krishna willing, I hope to see you again sometime. You're all welcome to Singapore. If you're stopping over, please come. Kansham Govind Prabhu, very happy to see you also. And we pray, you know, that... We continue to have your association. Everywhere I go, you know, devotees are so inspired by you. And I think that augurs very well for our yatras. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank, Thank you so much, Prabhu, for visiting us. Please uh, remember us. <laughs> yeah, I Please. definitely remember. It's so nice, you know. Please Thank visit, you. Please visit Sydney as often as you can. Yes, like yes. I, I'll be very happy to come in. I'm taking association, so I'm very happy. Thank you. 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 Thank